Good morning and welcome to Crossroads. If you don't know me, my name is Emily. I'm the worship leader here. We just have a few announcements for you this morning. Um, we want you to fill out your connection card on the website of the Crossroads app. If you need assistance with that, let us know. We'll be glad to help you. Um, we also wanted to remind you about Serve Together for Million County, October 3rd. Uh, they're going to have online sign up soon. It'll kind of give you some options of different uh, jobs that they're offering for us to do. And then last but not least, we do have um, Faith Promise booklets and cards in the back. If you want to pick one of those up and kind of look through and see what you want to do for Faith Promise this year, that would be wonderful. So if you would go ahead and stand and we'll open in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here, to be together, and to worship you together. Uh, I thank you for each person that's here this morning, and I pray that you would prepare their hearts for what you have for them. And be with Dad as he brings the message, and be with us as we lead in worship this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. to me, the only one whose favor I seek, the only name that matters to me, yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me, the only name that matters to me, and yours is the name.
to the tables to receive your communion and sing along with us.
Good morning. There we go. Didn't think I was on before. I hope you had a good week. I had kind of a blah week. I don't know if you ever have those. My uh, relationship with the Father was somewhat lacking this past week. and I'm not really going to go there for my meditation, but I just wanted to say that, you know, I am, I am so thankful that, that it's all based on what Jesus did and not on what I've done, because I wouldn't have a chance. And so, not my meditation, but just wanted to say that because it's important to me this week. I didn't have the greatest of weeks. And so, if you were here with us or joined us online a couple weeks ago on Wednesday night, we've been going through, uh, well, we were going through Exodus, now we're into Leviticus, but Robbie shared about the golden calf. And there's some really important verses in that story and I just wanted to highlight them this morning as we as we think about Jesus and what he's done for us so Moses is up on the mountain and and God gets upset and tells him you know the people are sinning Moses goes down he takes care of the calf the golden calf then he goes back up the mountain to see if he can make up for the sins of the people and the, the critical verse is verse 32. Moses says, Now please forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book you have written. So what Moses is doing in that moment is offering himself for the sins of the people. And it's interesting if you read on, the answer is really no. God says, No, you're not the one. But it's the offer. And in that moment, Moses is foreshadowing Jesus. Because Jesus will come and he will be the one. The answer will be yes. He will take on the sins of the people. And then later on in Exodus 33, God says, I will punish the people for their sin, but he's not going to destroy the whole nation. And he says, you go on to the promised land. I'll send an angel with you, but I'm not going to go with you. I can't go with this stiff-necked people because I'll destroy them. And Moses again pleads with God. He says, please, if you don't go with us, don't send us on. Because without you, we're just like everybody else. There's nothing special. And the Lord relents. And in verse 17, this is what he says. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. It's not because of the righteousness of the people that the Lord will go with them. It's because of Moses. It's because of the one. The righteousness of the one guarantees that God will go with the people. And I want to go to I just pick Mark. You can pick any of the Gospels. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus and he came up out of the water, a voice from heaven called out. And you remember what he said? This is my son 
in whom I am well pleased. You see, it's not our righteousness that allows us to be in relationship with the Father. It's not because of us that he walks with us. It's because of his son. Because he was the one. He said, I will take the sins of the people. And the father said, with you I am well pleased. It's because of Jesus. When we celebrate that this morning, we remember what Jesus did for us. He gave his body for us. And he shed his blood for us. Pray with me, please. Father God, this morning we, we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful, Father, for your son. We're thankful that he was willing to be the one. And Father, we know that that he was the only one that could be the sacrifice for our sin. As much as Moses wanted to, to pay the price for the sin of the people, he could not. For Moses was not perfect in himself, Father. Moses had his own problems, and so he was not worthy. And yet, Jesus came, and Jesus was worthy. Jesus is worthy. He had no sin of his own, and so he was able, and he was willing, and he took our sin, and he paid the price. And it's because you are pleased with him that you walk with us. And so we just thank you. We praise Jesus this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. I was born in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Every two years I was in a different school all my life. In four different families. In two different states. I was raised in a Baptist church, a strict Baptist church in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And in the Baptist church, at least up there, like here, the, the salvation and baptism you kind of do together. Uh, in the Baptist Church, well, in Michigan, we had Upper Peninsula. It was cold a good bit of the year. Didn't have a baptistry. So we were put on a list to be baptized in the lake in the spring, summer, when the water was warm enough. So they had this list, and I was actually baptized the same day that my grandmother was. When I got my boys to adulthood, I was going to go back before I got the second one grown, uh, along came the first grandchild. <laughs> and then two years later, the next grandchild, and I, I couldn't leave. Okay, I was um, getting ready to retire, and I lived at the main house, and I wanted to seek out a church that was close. And so I checked it out, and state. I've always kind of believed you should go when I, through the years, go to a church in the community where you are. And so then when I got retired, before I retired, I was going to another church because of the time frame when I got off work to go to church and I couldn't go to church here. So once I got retired, I started here uh, and just, uh, just stayed. Carol. Harris is my friend. We, we do things together. Um, senior luncheon, I like to bake. So I make cakes or cookies or whatever they want. Uh, Carol and I work in the nursery. Once a month we work in the nursery. Looking forward to doing that again. I knew when I was young I either wanted to be a teacher or a nurse. And so in my mid-30s I just went back to school and got my LPN. And I seem to be drawn to babies. I have decided that in my life, I've either been taking care of elderly 
or little ones. Always knew I was not going to have elderly parents to take care of because they died when I was young. But I worked in a lot of homes where I felt like I was helping other people take care of their parents. My parents died when I was 10. Uh, and my, well, my brother's sister's parents died when I was 10. It was a, in Michigan, a big old frame house. It was in the middle of the night. And I woke up, couldn't breathe. And I, so I looked for my mom, couldn't find her. Went, uh, went back to my room and broke a window. Got on a roof, a shed roof, and jumped down and went, went to my office to get help. Uh, next morning, my aunt and uncle took me to the hospital and told me that uh, they were all gone. They had all died in the fire and nobody else got out. So I was awarded to my grandmother and she wasn't well enough to take care of me, so we lived with my aunt and uncle and they lived down here. Every two years I was in a different school with different families until I got out of high school. My mother was a, a good, good mother for as long as I had her. She was a, very special. Going from a large family to an only, I, I was alone. I decided that if I could not be a loving grandmother, I wouldn't be in their life at all. And so I have loved my grandchildren and loved my great grandchildren. I, I did have um, a couple of older ladies say to me, God must have saved you for something special. Well, I kind of went into adulthood with that, thinking, what is, I kept searching, what is that special thing going to be for me? And I finally talked to a, a preacher that said, how do you know that where you're at right now, I was working in a nursing home, isn't where God wants you to be? And instead of looking for that great, awesome thing, it could just be like what I feel like I'm doing now. I'm taking care of children that I love. Hey, I'll tell you, uh, y'all probably thought I was going to play drums. But I forgot that we had a video. And so if you were cheating and had your eyes open, you saw Robbie come up and whisper in my ear uh, that we have a video, Miles. And I, for some reason, I always forget. But I did find a billfold and some keys back here. It's empty? <laughs> Eric, Eric says it's empty. Uh, but uh, yeah, key, keys to your truck. But anyway, so that's Rose Watson. Give her another. Her, her, her testimony is really a, a fascinating one. And I mean, just to capture it in a few minutes is difficult. And so we are proud that she is a part of uh, our Crossroads family and, and love Rose and and I promised her that I wouldn't make her wave her hand or anything, but she's sitting back on the back row. Um, so anyway, sorry, Rose. Hey, a couple other things I want to mention, but hey, thank you, and thank you, Rose, for being willing to, to do that. We're going to try to do that you know, more often just to kind of introduce you to people of the congregation and so you get to, to know them a little bit. So uh, thank you for your willingness to do that. I know... I know it's kind of out of your comfort zone, and, uh, and so anyway, thank you for, for doing that. Uh, we love you, and we love having you as a part of this congregation. And then, yeah, go ahead. You know, then I, I want to mention a couple of other people, um, just as far as prayer concerns. Um, I'm doing a, a service uh, on Tuesday for a lady who passed away in the community. And, and so uh, if you'd be praying for um, the Pierce family, Diane, Diane Pierce uh, passed away. So I'll be doing that service. And I'm meeting the family at 1 o'clock uh, this afternoon after service is here. So uh, be praying for, the, for the, that family, if you would. 
um, as well as praying for, for Mike O. Mike uh, goes back in for, or I think he's going back in, right? Uh, uh, sometime this week, you know, they let him come home over the weekend. He's, he's having some issues, and just so pray for Mike. Uh, as well as I heard from Helen Burton, I did not know that Helen Burton was having knee surgery this past week. And she joins Ju uh, Judy Donath, for example, who had knee surgery how many weeks ago? About a month ago? Three weeks ago? Month? Yeah. And so, yeah. Okay, so a few weeks ago she had uh, knee surgery, knee replacement. And, and so Helen had that on Thursday, and she was already home yesterday. And she called me and told me that she was home and she was doing well. So I want to make sure we mentioned, uh, you know, mentioned those folks and, and uh, some of the others who, um, you know, just having issues and maybe going, having procedures done. You know, the, 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 you guys know this, if you've been through any sort of procedure that um, you have to prepare for, you know, they make you take a COVID test and then they make you quarantine for a few days before, um, before that. And so, uh, you know, um, I know Dorothy is going to be quarantining and what a <laughs> blessing to our staff. <laughs> Here, here's the deal. Dorothy, Dorothy does a lot. Dorothy Goodner does a lot around here. And so we, we see her quite often and, uh, and it's always a blessing to see her, but she and I have a very uh, special and volatile, no, I'm just kidding, relationship. Uh, she'll come, she told me a long time ago, this was, this, when, I, when we were at, out at Old Union in the country, Dorothy told me, listen, if anybody's leaving, it's not me, is what she said. You know, you'll, you'll be the one leaving before I do. And, and she's right, uh, you know. Uh, but anyway... Uh, we have a good, you know, good, fun, back-and-forth relationship. And so uh, she is actually preparing for Wednesday. She'll be having cataract surgery. And so be praying for Dorothy as she prepares for that. Uh, and uh, I guess a, a praise. And Well, let me throw out one more thing uh, as an, an announcement. We're still meeting at 545, guys, uh, on Tuesday mornings, 545. I know that's early. But I think you could talk to the men who've been a part of it and know that, uh, uh, that it's been a blessing to them. And so come out and be a part of that. It's just a short challenge, and then uh, we pray, and, and, well, we share a little bit if anybody wants to share. And then we pray, and, and everyone goes out, you know, whether, whether they're retired, whether they are uh, in the work, you know, workforce, uh, we, we go out. And so it's just that feeling of, of being sent out, and or I hope it is, and uh, so anyway, come out and be a part of that. I know, for example, Dennis couldn't be there uh, this past week, because last Sunday, Dennis was in the emergency room, uh, didn't know that, uh, but, but he was, uh, you know, he was in the emergency room uh, for an injury that he suffered, and, and so anyway, uh, come out and be a part of that, and then finally, I want you to be praying for Lestan Hoskins. I know a couple of weeks ago, Robbie prayed for Lestan and for Community Church of God. But tonight, Lestan is officially being installed as the pastor at Community Church of God. And we were in Wisconsin, and I got a text from Lestan, and he said, I would be honored if you would come and attend uh, this installation service. And so I just responded, absolutely, you know. I mean, in talking about and talking about healing some things in the church, those are the things that we need to be doing. You know, building relationships with one another, being able to sit down and talk with one another. That's what's going to bring unity to the, to the church. And let me add this. The only way that we're going to be unified is by the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of his name. Yeah, that's really what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. We're talking about the church of Philadelphia. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be verses 7 through 13. And we're going to be talking about how there is, there is power in this name of Jesus. Emily, uh, you know, excellent choices of songs today. Um, Scott, I know 
you were telling me you had two or three things running around in your mind. You, you know, what amazes me is when I've got two or three things running around in my mind, what I do is I share all of them. <laughs> and, yeah, you know. And Scott, and Scott got up here and was right on point, you know. And again, what he was talking about is who Jesus is. It is Jesus who makes the difference. Oh, that the church in our, in our country, in our society, would understand that. I mean, it's, it's really not. I mean, listen, you know that there are churches that are growing that are like cowboy churches? You know there are churches that are growing that are really contemporary and, 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 and on a regular basis they use secular music sometimes. And they're growing, right? And, 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 and they're growing well. Let me put that. But the reason they're growing well is not because of the selection of worship music that they use. It's not because of the style that they use. Now, maybe that's true some places. And, and if it is, shame on them. Because the reason they should be growing is because the, the members and the, the leaders are active in making disciples. That's why they should be growing. I mean, I'll go clear back to... In the beginning of this series, one of the things we talked about was that the disciples held on to some things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They gathered together. They encouraged one another. They lifted one another up. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which is the Lord's Supper. And they devoted themselves to prayer. Those are the things they focused on. Nowhere in there. Now, it's all worship, don't get me wrong. But nowhere in there to say they devoted themselves to, you know, the rock band that was on the stage. Um, nowhere did it say they devoted themselves to the guys who played guitar and banjo on the stage. Right? And so, again, I'm not picking on worship. I love worship. I was hired as the worship leader. But worship means so much more. And, and even in the text, you're going to see that Jesus singles out a couple of things. He singles out a couple of things that they were noted for. Now, I'll tell you something about the Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia was one of the two churches that was not condemned for anything. In fact, they were commended for what they are doing. And so... This morning as we get into this, I've already kind of, uh, I've written down some notes and I promised my wife I was going to stick to the manuscript. So far I haven't done that. All right. So if I repeat a couple things in here, I just want to make, listen, I just want to make sure that I share what God has laid up on my heart and that I do it accurately and that I do it, that I do it well because he deserves that. Listen, that should have brought an Amen. Because I'm telling you, he deserves that, that we do things well, and that we do it in, in, in an orderly fashion, that we do it in a passionate fashion, but that we do it well for him. Because this is one of my acts of worship, to preach his name. And, and so the passage, um, I can't even read. The passage opens with the formula that Jesus has been using with each of the seven churches. And Dustin reminded us last week of that formula in his message. And by the way, you know, I thought Dustin did a great job with the passage that he was given. You know, to a church that's told to wake up. And it's to wake up to who Jesus is. Because Jesus says, if you don't wake up, then I'm going to come like a thief in the night. And I'm going to come and, and, and you won't be prepared, right? And, and so Dustin did a great job last week, as Robbie did two weeks ago. And, and so this morning, um, you know, we're going to look at uh, Jesus introducing himself to, as the author of the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. And this is what he says, okay, in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. 
What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Now, a little background on the city of Philadelphia. The city itself was not very big, and neither was the congregation of believers who lived there. I'll tell you how we know that in just a little bit. But Philadelphia did not share the influence uh, that some of the other cities um, uh, that we've talked about so far. So, so Philadelphia didn't have the, you know, the big ports, and, 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 and so... You know, when people thought about the city of Philadelphia, they remembered two things. One, the area was known for its many and devastating earthquakes. How do you like to live somewhere like that? In fact, we have our own state that kind of suffers that kind of thing, right? California. And, and, and so uh, it was known for its many and devastating earthquakes. Number two, that's the first thing people thought of. Number two that the city's name meant, anybody know what Philadelphia means? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. And this city kind of held up to that. I don't know that our Philadelphia does, you know, but it means brotherly love. In fact, the city was established in 189 B.C. by King Eumenes II of Pergamon, and he named it for his younger brother, Italus II, who had the nickname... Um, Philadelphos. Philadelphos. That's what, that's what his big brother called him. That's what people called him was Philadelphos, which literally means one who loves his brother. One who loves his brother. I'm not sure my brother and I had that kind of relationship. Uh, would you say so? No, I'm, just, I'm not going to ask my mom. But I know what it's like because I have that kind of relationship with someone else right now. Actually, I have that relationship with a few um, guys where I can look at them and, and say that they are, they are brothers who love their brother. You know. By the way, I want to mention Dan uh, right now, Dan and Ramona. Um, you know, they're just, they're, they're well, Dan... Dan is kind of progressing uh, away from this life and into the next life. And so just be praying for Dan and Ramona and Jennifer and Sarah and, and just that family, uh, if you would. I've been spending some time with him. I'm going to continue to spend time with him. And, and then I'll tell you, the, the big jerk asked me to do his funeral. I, I, I tease that as the big jerk, but uh, it's going to be one of the toughest things that I do, so be praying for us, you know, as we prepare. So, so Jesus is addressing this small group of Christians in Philadelphia, and we know this about them because if you look in the text in verse 8, he says, I know that you have little strength. Now, when we need, what we need to realize is, is that this little church of Philadelphia is not described as being worn out, but rather they are small in number. And the reason we know they're not worn out is because when he says, I know your deeds, he commends them. You're staying in there. You're doing what you're supposed to do. And so they're, they're little in number. It's a small congregation there in Philadelphia. And so let me ask you this. He says, I know that you have a little strength. Have you ever been in that position where you felt outnumbered? You ever, you ever been in that position where you felt outnumbered or you felt overwhelmed? I think that's a little more like it. Oh, I think we got a school teacher over here shaking her head that's saying that she feels outnumbered, right? And I think that sometimes, you know, maybe our school teachers do that too. I know one in particular must. I can't think of who Daxon's kindergarten teacher is, but she would probably feel a little overwhelmed. Anyway, that's what's going on here in, in, in Philadelphia. Um, they're feeling outnumbered. They're feeling overwhelmed. He, had, he identifies a congregation that is against them in Philadelphia. He calls them the synagogue of Satan. They're Jews. They're, they're Old Testament Jews. Okay, and, 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 and so he says, he says to this church, 
Don't worry about them. I'm, gonna, I'm opening a door that nobody can shut. And we'll come back to some of that in just a little bit. You know, maybe in our culture today, there are believers who are experiencing that feeling of being overwhelmed, of being outnumbered, that everywhere you turn, you know, someone is telling you some new rule, right? And, and, and so if you turn on the television, you get it every day that we're experiencing this overwhelming, you know, oppression almost. I, you know, I'm not, I, I want to be careful with that word because oppression happens in so many different ways. And so maybe we're speaking to some people through the live feed or some people here who are feeling a little overwhelmed. And maybe even to the point where they're saying, why even try? Why even try? And so there are Christians who are just giving up, you know? Is it any wonder that Jesus introduces himself to the Philadelphia Christian Church in this manner? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. In this description, Jesus offers three distinct truths about himself. He says he is holy, he says that he is true, and he says that he holds the key. In sharing these truths, Jesus reminds his disciples of his character and his authority. It's what we sung about this morning. He alone, it's his name alone that carries authority. And, and, and then Scott shared with us about his holiness. We sang about his holiness as well. It's his righteousness. And, and we ought to celebrate that because you don't deserve what God has to give, and neither do I. But through Jesus, through Jesus we are brought into the family. And so who do we hold on to? We hold on to him. We proclaim him. Now, before I talk about those particular truths more in detail, I, I want to just take a moment to share what I believe is a dangerous and even horrific tendency I have observed within the American church. Quite simply, I believe many Christians and pastors have forgotten or lost sight of who Jesus really is. Our congregations have become locations that sometimes look more like concert venues or even counseling centers where we talk about the 10 key ways to strengthen marriage and we talk about those things rather than being, um, rather than being centered on the gospel of Jesus. Now I'm not saying that those things aren't valuable. But, but quite honestly, I think our churches spend too much time rather than teaching about who Jesus is and the power of his name. You see, the gospel is the good news of Jesus. And the good news of Jesus is that he is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever. Amen? I'll ask for him. Jesus is the power. He is the glory. And he is the kingdom. He just says, I have the key of David and I have the key to the kingdom. It's Jesus. I hold the key. Jesus shares in this letter to the church of Philadelphia that very fact. I hold the key. And it's time for the church of America to hear and embrace that fact. It is Jesus who holds the key. And not all of our other gimmicks, not all of our other programs, not even our protests. Jesus holds the key. He is the answer. Just in case you're tempted to respond like a man I was talking with recently who said to me, Miles, we all know that Jesus is the answer. The question is how do we address and heal our social issues? You're getting it. I have to tell you, i got to be honest about my answer to that question. Here's, here's what I thought, and here's a part of what I said. 
But I stepped back and I listened just a little bit and I said, pardon me for just a second. I don't mean to interrupt you and I don't mean any disrespect, but are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? How do we do it? (laughs) We preach Jesus. We teach Jesus. When we're in our relationships out there in the world, we present Jesus. That's it. By the way, that is what Jesus himself told us to do. Change the world, not through social justice. Change the world, not by political means. Can I say that again, Crossroads? We don't change the world we, by, by political means, and we don't do it through social justice. We were assigned one thing, and that is to make disciples. And if we were more busy making disciples, maybe some things would take care of itself within our society and within our political landscape. Do not put your faith and your trust in social programs. Do not put your faith and your trust in political parties. And I have to say that because there are some of you who do. When the Democratic Party becomes more important than what Jesus says, when the Republican Party becomes more important than what Jesus says, whenever the Green Party becomes more important than what Jesus says, even when Bernie's teachings become more important than what Jesus says, the church has something out of order. Now we're getting fired up. And and can I say one other thing that I'll add in there? It's not going to be changed by Facebook rants. (laughs) Thank you. Because most of the people, hey, and I'm going to just say this. Most of the people who are ranting on Facebook don't have the courage to stand up in a platform and say it. They want to hide behind their Facebook page. And and what they do is if somebody disagrees, then, then they just block them. You know, it reminds me so much of what Jesus said. People go to what their tickling ears want to hear. And we're living in that age. Listen, I'll tell you something about some of the pastors in Danville. They don't necessarily agree with, you know, my opinion. And I will tell you, I don't necessarily agree with theirs. But we're talking. We're talking, we're debating. And so I told this man um, that. I, I, I said, the only way the kingdom grows is by the mighty name of Jesus. You know, even Paul said that. Paul said, all, you know, all I do is plant the seed, and then Apollos came along and he watered it, but it's God who brings the growth. Man, when will we learn that in our churches, in our, in our congregations, in, in this society? Um, and, and so let me add a, another thing that really disturbs me. I shared a conversation with a man I truly respect, and, and I'm not going to share his name because I didn't ask permission for this. But he informed me that there's a growing epidemic of pastors and leaders in the church who have become, I will say, disenchanted with the truth of God. In other words, they've lost their faith. Um, They've lost their faith. And yet, here's the disturbing part, part. They remain in their positions because they do not know where else to go. Faithless preachers. And it's happening in our society in a growing number of locations and congregations faithless preachers now let let me take it just a little further i'm being nice am i not i'm being nice but 
I don't believe that it's exclusive to pastors and leaders. Is it possible that our churches, our congregations, are full of faithless Christians? If so, then I believe that we have identified the true issue in our society and in our country. Church, we must remember and embrace the truth of Jesus Christ. There's power in His name. I mean, there is power to redeem us. There is power to forgive us. There is power to bring down strongholds. There is power to restore relationships. And there is ultimate power to face this life. Power to endure until He takes us home. There's power in His name. And right now, Bonnie Gaston is amen and all over. Is she not? She is... She is amen and all over the place. And Dan's back there raising his hands because there's power in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we must proclaim the name and the work of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus writes to this church in Philadelphia and he says he is the one who is holy. He is the one who is true. And he alone holds the key that opens doors that no one else can shut. And he shuts doors that no one else can open. And this little church believed him. I mean, look at what it says about this group of believers. Jesus says, I know your deeds See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Do you see it there? I mean, do you see what we've been talking about? Two characteristics of a faithful church, disciples who keep the word of God. It is our source of truth. No matter what it says, I may not like it, you may not like it, But the one who holds the key, the one who is holy, the one who is true, he proclaimed every every letter and every mark in this book comes from him. And so he says, hey, I know you have a little strength, but here's what I know. You have kept my word. You've kept the truth. And then he says a second thing. You know, two characteristics of a faithful church, disciples who who keep the word of God, and number two, Christians who refuse to deny his name. Now let me go back quickly and just kind of finish up the characteristics that he shares about himself. He says that he is holy. You, You know, on Wednesday nights, we started the book of Leviticus this past week. And and in the book of Leviticus, he sets up the sacrificial system. And, and he sets up the tabernacle. They, they begin to build the tabernacle. You know, this is a place where God dwells on earth. You know, he, 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 the God of the universe cannot be contained in a box. But for their benefit, he came down. And, and he, he chose this little room called the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant is placed in there. And, Jesus, and, and God says, I'm going to dwell there with you. But here's the deal. I am a holy God. And because I'm a holy God, you need to do these things. You need to not do some things, but you need to do these things. And here's the deal. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because of their sin. Nobody could do it. You couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But they couldn't do it. And so he sets up this system of sacrifice because only through the shedding of blood is there forgiveness. And so he sets up this system of sacrifice so he can come and dwell with his people. He can be there. Did you not hear what Scott shared? Uh, at one point, God said, I cannot go with these stiff-necked people. And if there's ever a warning to the church, may that illustration be a warning to the church today in America. America. We need to embrace the righteousness of Jesus and we need to proclaim Him 
as the answer. And so we've been talking about that God is holy. He alone is holy. And what he's done for us, folks, is he sent his son, a part of the Godhead, Jesus, he sent him to the earth to, to, to fulfill the law. Not only to fulfill the law, but to be the final sacrifice, to shed his blood for us so that we may be made holy because we're covered by the blood. And that's the only reason that someone can describe themselves as being holy or righteous. It's not by your behavior. It's not by your attitude. It's not by any of those things. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus introduces himself as the one who is holy. Then he goes, I'm the one that's true. And what he's pointing towards is his truth. All, every source of truth flows from the Father, or the source of truth flows from the Father. No matter what the world says, no matter how the world tries to redefine things, truth comes from God. And so we hold on to his truth. And this congregation in Philadelphia is doing just that. And then finally he says, I am the one who holds the key. Do you know that you also hold a key? I'm borrowing this from Pastor Tony Evans. But you also hold a key because Jesus has given it to you. Just like he gave keys to Peter. The key that we hold is whatever it is that God wants us to do in this life. And sometimes we try to open a door that God doesn't want us opening. And so he keeps it shut. You know why? Because as Pastor Tony Evans says, he has the master key. And the only way that the combination works is, is we use our key and he backs it up with his key and he opens doors that nobody else can shut and he shuts doors that no one else can open. And so he, and notice he, he describes it as the key of David. That goes back to David and his kingship and how the promise was is there's one who is coming so that your throne will go on forever. Well, Jesus is that one. I hold the key of David. And so, as I said, you, you know that this body of believers in Philadelphia is one of two churches that are, are not condemned at all by Jesus. In fact, Jesus reassures them that he's coming soon and that what they are to do is to hold on to what they have. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write upon them the name of my God and the name of the city of God, the, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. That's a lot of names. But realize why. He will write those names upon them because they have not denied his name. And so the name of God will be written. I mean, here are the promises that Jesus makes to them. First of all, he says they will be pillars in the temple of God. I mean, if they hold on and they continue to keep his word and they continue to not deny the name of Jesus... They will be made a pillar in the temple of God. Now, we kind of have some built-in illustrations here. What is a pillar? Well, we got a couple of them back there. We have four of them right here in this room. They're, they're, we call them posts, but they're pillars. They're holding up something, you know. Uh, we've got these, we got these covered up, which I, I have to say this was kind of a source of soreness for a couple people. But... But we got pillars right there. They're holding up this ceiling above the, the baptistry. And if you look real hard, well, actually, we covered those up too, sorry. Um, but they look like those two back there. The pillars, they hold things up. They're firm. They cannot be moved unless, unless Samson comes along. 
You know, they, they cannot be moved. And, and why are they told that there'll be pillars in the temple of God? Because they have stood firm in keeping God's word. Because they have not denied his name. And so in heaven, not only will they be pillars that help hold up the temple, but he says they will be known by the name of God, the name of the holy city of Jerusalem, and the new name of Jesus. Translation, they belong to him. They belong to him. Folks, we are living in a difficult and dangerous time. I don't don't mean the coronavirus and And I really don't mean the the racial differences that we have when I say dangerous. Because can I tell you something? Something that I learned a long time ago. There is something that is worse than death itself. There's something worse than what you may be facing, whether it be cancer, whether it be, you know... um, AIDS, whether it be Alzheimer's, there's something worse. And that's an eternity outside of the presence of God. That's what I mean by dangerous. We need to pay attention, particular attention, to our spiritual walk with God. Not only do we face the the busyness and the distractions of life when it comes to that. My goodness, you know, we are all susceptible to that. Do I go to the study at 545 or do I sleep in? Do I go to Wednesday night um, Bible study or do I go somewhere else? We, We all face those distractions. I mean, even yesterday, and this is kind of a, 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 it might seem like minor, but even yesterday before it rained, um, I had a choice. I could go fishing or I could mow the yard. You, you know which one I chose? Fishing. The house needs painting. The yard needs mowing. Where's he at? Gone fishing. We, we get distracted by all sorts of... By the way, Chris and I stayed too long. We were up the river when it began to rain a little bit, and I was talking to Dan on the phone, and finally I said, Dan, I got to go because it is starting to pour down rain. We put on these rain suits. These rain suits didn't work. And we got soaked before we got back to the, to the boat ramp. What? What was that? I still didn't hear you. It's probably a good thing. I deserve it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Lord immersed me yesterday again. I mean, I thought the floods of Noah were coming for a while. And uh, anyway, but we all get distracted from the spiritual things of life. And we face the age-old temptation of bringing the beliefs and the actions of the world around us into the kingdom. And I'm telling you, that that's going on. There are those who are adding to the gospel. You know what the scripture says about adding to the word of God? It says do not add and do not subtract. Now the, the, tr- the honest truth is every one of us does it. But we better wake up. There are those who are adding to the scriptures, adding to the gospel, and that should not be. I want to conclude with just reading a song. I I should go back and just quote the lyrics of the very first song, The Name of Jesus. But Steve Green wrote a song several years ago, and it's entitled God and God Alone. And I want you to pay pay particular uh, attention to the first verse that I share. God and God alone created all these things that we call our own. 
From the mighty to the small, the glory in them all is God and God's alone. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown. You know, even those things that, that people are working on right now to try to discover, even, hey, even, even the coronavirus vaccination, vaccination, God only already knows the combination for that. Have you ever thought about that? The cure for cancer, God already knows it. That's who he is. God and God, oh, I promise you I'd just stick to the lyrics. Let me go back to that though. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown. And all the best and worst of man won't change our master's plan. It's God's and God's alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home. I have to stop there because here's the struggle we have, and I don't know if you realize it or not. The struggle we have is that people are trying to make this place, earth, they're trying to make this heaven. And they're doing it in, by means that God doesn't accept. They're saying, let's clean up all the social issues. And we can't. We can't. This is an imperfect place. And it's ruled over by the father of lies. And yet people step in. We try, I've already said this, but we try politically. And it doesn't make any, hey, who you put in the White House? Who we put in the White House? I haven't decided whether I'm voting or not. I'm just going to tell you that. Because I have a king. I have a king. And he tells me that whoever is in that house doesn't really hold the key. He does. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home. He will be our desire, our one desire. Our hearts will never tire of God and God alone. And then he concludes with the chorus again. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. And so I have one simple question for you this morning. Does God rule over the throne of your heart? Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you stand with us for a decision time?
down we'll pray with you we'll pray for you I was thinking when when Miles was preaching as he was wrapping up a, a verse came into my mind it's in 1 Corinthians and it's just Paul talking to the Corinthians and he says we preach Christ that's it we preach Christ that's what we're supposed to do and so I guess maybe that's the challenge for the day preach Christ I'm going to pray and, and you'll be dismissed but once again if, man if you need prayer for something or you need, just need to talk to somebody stick around and see us we'll put our masks on I, I won't hold everybody's hand but I, I know Ed and Joan pretty well so if you need prayer just come Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to, to be here today. Father, we thank you that, that our fate is, is not up to our performance or our, our failures, Father. We thank you that you've made a way. And we thank you, Father, that that you've made it easy for us. All we have to do is, is hear the message and believe and put our faith and our trust in your Son, not in ourselves, not in our actions, not in our attitudes, Father. And through that message and through that hope, we are changed, Father. We do have better actions. We do have better attitudes. But it's because of the faith that we have in your son. That faith changes us, Father. Not as a, an attempt to, to earn the reward that you've given us. And so, Father, I pray as we, as we depart from this place that, that we leave with that on our hearts we preach Christ we don't have to sell programs we don't have to sell meetings we don't have to sell anything but Christ everything else would flow from that message so we just ask it in his name amen